It's all comedy in theory. We can laugh at what we need. It's all comedy in theory. We can laugh at what we want. Welcome to It's All Comedy in Theory. A historic and hilarious look at who and what makes us laugh. I'm your host, Charlie Spink. In today's episode, we look at the influence of the golden age of radio on American comedy. Now, some of our younger listeners may be asking, what the hell is radio? Radio was the closest thing that cave people had to streaming content. Until, one day Joe Rogan tripped over an extension cord, and bam, he invented the podcast. The rest is as they say, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. The golden age of radio, also known as old time radio era, had this theme song. Just take that radio off the shelf. I sit and listen to it by myself. Downloads ain't got no soul. I need that old time radio era was a time in which American radio was the dominant electronic home entertainment medium. It began with the birth of commercial radio broadcasting in the early 1920s and lasted through the 1950s. Radio broadcasting was the cheapest form of public entertainment and it gave audiences a far better entertainment experience than they'd grown accustomed to. Its popularity grew rapidly and by 1934, 60% of the nation's household had radios. What about the other 40%? Well, they had the sweet sound of children complaining about not having a radio. During this period, people regularly tuned in and families gathered to listen to their favorite radio programs. A variety of new entertainment formats and genres were created for radio, many of which later migrated to television. But of course, we're going to focus on the comedy shows. Why? Because this show's all about comedy, theoretically. Radio comedy in the United States began when comedian Raymond Knight launched a musical variety show. It was called Knight Rider. Yes, the show featured a talking Model T. I'm kidding, of course. The Cuckoo Hour debuted in 1930, back when David Hasselhoff was still in middle school. The comedy duo Stoopnagel and Bud had their network debut in 1931. Bud Hullock and Frederick Taylor were both announcers at Buffalo, New York station WMAK, where they were fondly known as the W Mac Daddies. Pretty gangster, right? They came together as a team when a transmitter failure kept the station from receiving the scheduled network program. To prevent the dreaded dead air, they delivered a barrage of spontaneous impromptu quips. Hullet called Taylor, Colonel Stoopnagel, while Taylor played songs on the organ. The audience responded with so much enthusiasm, they became a regular feature on WMAK, and within a year, they were headed for New York City. A few comedy shows originated as stage productions, and others were adapted from comic strips, such as Blondie, Dick Tracy, Gasoline Alley, Lil Abner, Lil Orphan Annie, Popeye, and Archie. Less popular shows included FDR's Legs, Fun with Communism, and my personal favorite, Flappers Doing Phone Sex Ads. Quiz shows were lampooned on the program It Pays to Be Ignorant, while gags galore were delivered weekly on shows like Stop Me If You've Heard This One and Can You Top This? These were panel shows devoted to the art of telling and sharing jokes. Radio naturally attracted top comedy talent from both vaudeville and Hollywood. The Zeigfeld Follies On Air was broadcast on CBS radio during the 1930s. The lineup of guests included Fanny Bryce, Will Rogers, probably Betty White, and even Zeigfeld himself. Fanny Bryce appeared in a sketch series that eventually expanded into the Baby Snook Show. Radio historian Arthur Frank Wiffman recalls a few Baby Snook's pranks. Planting a bee's nest in her mother's club meeting, inserting marbles into her father's piano, and smearing glue all over her baby brother. Talk about a sticky situation. Snook's proved so universally appealing that Bryce was invited to perform in character on the second installment of The Big Show, NBC's big budget, last ditch effort to keep classic radio variety programming alive. Another popular radio attraction was on-air ventriloquists. Not making this up. Ventriloquism, live, on the radio. If today's listening audience was this gullible, then this would be a perfect time to tell you that I haven't opened my mouth this whole time. Amazing, isn't it? By 1940, the largest audiences were for the evening programs of variety shows. Music, drama, and comedy all mixed together. Situational comedies also gained popularity. Comedy programming ran the gamut from small-town humor to highly sophisticated sarcasm. <laughs> Poor people can't laugh at our jokes. <laughs> knee slapper. I won't slap my own knee, but somebody pay my butler to do it. 
Situational comedies were a huge departure from the biggest broadcasting program in the early 1940s. That program, of course, was World War II. One of the few times that the sequel was actually better than the original. Cliff Nesteroff, who is much quoted here, provides an excellent detailed account of American radio comedy in his book, The Comedians. Eddie Cantor was one of the first major radio comedians. Mel Brooks was a young fan at the time and said, Eddie Cantor was very important to me, very influential on my work. The sketches were fast and furious, and Cantor was great at supporting the other guy in the sketch. It was Cantor who was making it all work for me. Comedian Ed Wynn hosted the popular radio show, The Fire Chief, in the early 1930s. Like many former vaudeville performers who turned to radio in that same decade, he performed each program as an actual stage show, using visual bits to augment his written material. Wynn also pioneered the idea of a studio audience. He was terrified of performing in front of an audience he couldn't see. As am I. I've been wetting my pants this whole time. When he was signed to NBC, Wynn's contract stipulated the need for a live audience. NBC renovated their entire radio studio to accommodate an audience. And thus, the live studio audience was birthed into existence. Hey Dina, when are we gonna spring to get a live studio audience in here? Oh, what's that? When I get funnier? When I get people to subscribe? When we make money? Okay, never mind then. Move it on, keep it rolling. Comedian Henny Youngman, who is now a very old man, take my joke, please. Comedian Henny Youngman was responsible for bringing Abbott and Costello to the radio. When Youngman left the Kate Smith Hour for a gig on Paramount, he looked for someone to replace him for the Smith Show. Youngman recalled, Abbott and Costello were working in burlesque, and because burlesque comedy had to be at that time filthy to keep up with the strip teasers, both Bud and Lou were working very, very dirty. Regardless, they were hired by the Kate Smith Show. Mel Brooks said, Bud Abbott was a genius, and Lou Costello was one of the greatest comics in movies. Together, Bud and Lou were sublimely funny. Duffy's Tavern was an American radio situational comedy written by Ed Gardner and Eddie Green. The program often featured celebrity guests, but always hooked them around the misadventures, get-rich-quick schemes, and romantic missteps of the title establishment's malaprop-prone, metaphor-mixing manager, Archie, portrayed by Gardner. Many high-profile comedy guests, including Fred Allen, Lucille Ball, Gracie Field, and the legendary Bob Hope, were featured on the show. Remembered more for controversy than content, Amos and Andy was one of the most prolific comedies in broadcast history. They had over 4,000 episodes by 1943. It was also believed that Amos and Andy plagiarized most of their material from Duffy's Tavern. Charles Correll and Freeman Godson played the Amos and Andy characters. To offset the objections of audio blackface, they began hiring non-white cast members. During their run, they employed more black actors than any other show in radio. However, after World War II, racial comedy quickly fell out of favor. As Jack Benny explained, During World War II, attitudes changed. Hitler's ideology of Aryan supremacy put all ethnic humor in a bad light. Speaking of Jack Benny, the Jack Benny program was one of America's most popular radio shows and was a massive influence on the sitcom genre. Benny often portrayed his character as a miser and ridiculously claimed to be 39 years old, regardless of his actual age. My grandmother's been doing the same thing for the last 40 years. Benny was one of the most endearing comedians of the 20th century, and he managed to do something no other comedian could. His penny-pinching persona became so familiar with listeners that it made setups completely unnecessary. For example, whenever somebody told Benny the price of anything, Jack could evoke and then milk a laugh simply by remaining silent. Gary Giddens once wrote, Benny may be the only great comedian in history who isn't associated with a single witticism. He was the ultimate reactor, and it made him a comedy star. Albert Brooks added, He was the center of the storm. He let the players do the work, and just by being there, made it funny. Milton Berle was a popular radio guest in 1939, and was the host of Stop Me If You've Heard This One. In the late 1940s, he canceled well-paying nightclub appearances to expand on his radio career. Berle described the Milton Berle show, of which he loved the title character, as the best radio show I ever did. Hell of a funny variety show, if I do say so myself. Rudy Valley was the host of the Fleischmann's Yeast Hour. Yeah, catchy name, right? He always signed on by saying, hi oh everybody. The Yeast Hour started rising in 1929. Cliff Nesteroff described Valley as being the Johnny Carson of his day, introducing new acts and turning them into stars. George Burns, Gracie Allen, Milton Berle, Fanny Bryce, and even Victor Borg all appeared on Valley's radio show. 
Ad agencies and corporate sponsors controlled most of radio programming during the old time era. Shows had obvious and not very attractive names like The Ever Ready Hour, The Chase and Sanborn Hour, and again, The Fleischman Yeast Hour. Hosts were required to plug sponsored products, everything from Jell-O to ginger ale to razors and cigarettes. During the shows, Nesterov wrote that few comedians dare defy that atmosphere. However, a couple did, namely Fred Allen and Henry Morgan. Fred Allen objected to the rules and restrictions imposed by sponsors and said, Men who ran oil companies, drug, food and tobacco corporations, were attending auditions, engaging talent, and their untutored opinions adversely influenced the destinies of true artists. If radio comedy was lousy, it was because of the sponsors that wanted it that way. Allen also said, Radio comedy is the most painful form of entertaining. This pressure for new ideas drives every comedian on the air. You can't copyright a joke. You can't tell a new joke on the radio without hearing it on every other radio comedy during the week. Henry Morgan was a crankier version of Allen. Nesteroff wrote, Morgan told his listeners not to buy Lifesavers candies because they were missing their middle. He also lost Schick as a sponsor when he said on air, Schick razors were educational. Try one. That'll teach you. Morgan was quoted as saying, I grew up thinking it was American to be outspoken. I've since learned that it's un-American. Although traditional comedy was once a significant part of the American broadcast radio programming, it's now mainly found in the old archives of old-time radio enthusiasts and on internet sites that still stream old-time radio recordings. Glad somebody saved them. Next up, we'll be taking a look at comedy hitting record stores, the record-making and record-breaking world of making records, comedy records. Why comedy? Because it's all comedy in theory. Thank you for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to get more. It's all comedy in theory. I'm Charlie Spink, and you're very welcome. It's all jokes. It's all good. Comedy, baby. Ha <laughs> ha.